Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Michael Palmisano, and welcome back to the hit song Formula. This is where we endeavor to understand how the biggest songs from the biggest bands of all time came to be. And today, it's about one of my favorite bands of all time, certainly my favorite one when I was an adolescent youth, a young teenager, and that is Nirvana. So what we're going to do here is we're going to outline and go through the main parts of what makes a song a song. The rhythm, the harmony, the melody, the arrangement, and the lyrics to see what makes the hit the hit. So we're going to outline their top five, okay? So you got Come As You Are, In Bloom, Heart Shaped Box, Smells Like Teen Spirit, and Lithium. Yes, I know that there's more. These are just arguably the most commercially successful picks. Quick note here, I'm not going to talk about the production. I'll leave that to my friends Rick Beato and Warren Hewer to tackle stuff like that. And for all you GuitarGate subscribers out there taking my lessons and courses, you can watch this video ad-free and get all of my notes in PDF form to show you how I make these videos. Just go under videos and search hit song formula. So without further ado, here's the Nirvana hit song formula. Number one, let's start with the lyrics and subject matter. Because to be the biggest band in the world, to write the biggest songs in the world, your scope, your audience, your, your, um, your lens of impact, if you will, has to be at the highest level. So when they came out with Nevermind in particular, when Smells Like Teen Spirit dropped and, and Come As You Are and all those, it hit the bullseye dead on. And that is the adolescent, teenager, 12 to 19, that is the most impressionable time in your life, especially for music, for everything, but especially for music. Think about all the biggest bands in the world from all these different genres, the stuff you love, your parents love, they parent, their parents loved. More often than not, you're talking about bands that were huge when they were coming up. So if you mix that with a message that identifies with those people, that generation, on the coming up, that's the bullseye. And Nirvana hit it so square on the nose. I mean, it couldn't have been done better. The names of these songs, Smells Like Teen Spirit, okay? Come As You Are, Heart Shaped Box, In Bloom, okay? These are songs about coming of age and the new feelings inside you, the rage and the angst and sexual frustration and and am I the only one that feels like this? And and am I alone? Do they see me? Right? That early 90s kind of weird time that that was. Um, and Kurt, his message was to those people. His songs were a description, a reflection of what that generation was coming up into. Huge. Okay? Absolutely huge. Number two, these are massive sing-alongs, okay? Can't stress sing-along enough. Kurt was an interesting guy, okay? He, he, his fame, if you will, he crafted it, and then you could argue that it destroyed him. But he wanted to be the biggest band in the world. He wanted Smells Like Team Spirit to be the ultimate pop song. So what are pop songs? They are songs not for other musicians, okay? These are songs for everybody to sing in unison, loud, in stadiums and cars and everything in between. Everything was built on sing-alongs. Can't stress that enough. Think about it. And that leads to my third point about the lyrics and just the emotional content in general. All the big songs are left with the song ending out the chorus in a chant, in everybody singing or screaming in unison, right? It's a mantra. It's a confession or maybe an admonition, right? A warning. 
It's this thing that everybody screams and sings over and over and over again together. Just that repetition, driving it in your brain. A simple message of I see you, I feel you, this is strange, you're not the only one, is the lasting takeaway from all of these hit Nirvana songs. And it's just the impact cannot be overstated. It is absolutely massive. Second area, the rhythm or the rhythm section, if you will. This is a power trio, okay? So you have drums, you have bass, and you have a single guitar. And there is one vocal mic, okay? Um, there's, there's no backup singers. Uh, there's no extra... I mean, it is straight and narrow. So what do you have to do here? One, you let Dave Grohl live the rock and roll dream and drive the bus the whole way. I'm talking loud, unapologetic rock and roll drums. Huge flams. Brata, brata, brata. Huge flams. Huge fills, okay? And even when he's playing... Um, you know, during the verses or whatever, it's not like he's got this, I mean, he brings it down in volume, but it's not like he's got this light sensitive touch. There's not like there's a lot of ghost notes happening, okay? This is straight ahead rock and roll, okay? Again, meant for stadiums, meant for the largest audience. Now, two, you got Chris Novoselic on bass. Now, in a power trio, Basically, and you have a big rock and roll drummer, you basically have two fundamental roles, and Chris does them perfectly, okay? Number one, match the guitar riff to make it as big and fat as possible. So Kurt's playing basic guitar riffs, power chords, okay? And Chris is underneath them, trying to make them lock in with Dave as big and huge as possible, because remember, the three of them are the rhythm section. There's nothing else. So just like Black Sabbath style, okay, your goal is to be as in unison and huge as can be. The other role, which you see Chris do extremely well, is just with Dave in the verses in particular, when Kurt isn't playing or he's playing a really simple, quiet part, is to drive just a pulse that rides the groove. Now remember the groove is really, it's the kick pushes, the snare releases, but it's the hi-hat or the ride that creates the subdivision. And so Chris is riding that ride or that hi-hat with Dave virtually every single time, eighth notes, 16th notes. But if Dave's t -t 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 -t, Chris is duh, 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 duh. They, are, they are a unit, they are a train, and they are, they are the drivers of this rhythm section. Then, of course, you have Kurt. Big riffs, power chords, huge and simple, two sounds. You got one clean, kind of chorusy sound, one big distorted sound. That's it. Uh, there is not much else to the actual rhythm section. So you got big, unapologetic rock and roll drums. You have, you have Chris laying down the bass, keeping that steady groove, not a lot of space being left, okay? It, it's, it's a trio, right? And then when Kurt's playing these big power chord riffs with distortion, he's trying to make them as big and fat as possible. That's your rhythm section. Number three, harmony. Now we'll get into some playing examples here. Here's the thing. Harmony is, is basically... What tonality are we in? Are we in a key, namely G? Is it major or minor? What, whatever that is, okay? That's what harmony means. But the interesting thing about Nirvana's harmony is that Kurt virtually never plays anything beyond the power chord, which is made up of the root and the fifth. But the other note in the chord that makes any chord a chord would be the third. It's actually the most powerful note in any chord. It creates the function of the chord more than any other note. So him leaving that out, omitting the third, and just playing big, chunky power chords 
Um, really, it sounds rudimentary. It, it really lends itself to that angsty teenage story, like it's not refined yet. But as we will find in the melody, that's where Kurt creates the chords with his melody. That's the beauty. So you have these big power chords, and wait for it, moving in minor thirds. The, all of his riffs, for the most part, he tends to favor a minor third shift, like Smells Like Teen Spirit. This is just power chord on F, goes over a fourth to B flat, then the whole thing goes up a minor third. Check it, take a listen. Huge, right? All right, check out In Bloom. So look, it doesn't always go down, right? So you got B flat down to G, right? That's a minor third jump, okay? Then down to F, up to A flat going up a minor third. So you're taking these basic power chord structures and there's a commitment to getting that minor third jump. And when we go into the melody, we'll find out how Kurt makes that work. It's just a genius, phenomenal thing that happens. The last thing I'll mention about harmony is you also have riffs like Smells Like Teens, or like a Come As You Are. <laughs> Now notice, he plays it tuned down. I didn't tune down for this video, but harmonically this is correct. You have a chromatic walk up to G minor, or sorry, to E minor, you have E and G, back down to D, and the power chord. So you have chromatic movements, but virtually no voice leading. No voice leading, that's a key thing. So you have power chords, a commitment to minor third movements in the power chords, and virtually zero voice leading. Voice leading is when you take, find the closest note of a chord. So like, let's say I'm going from C to G. I could go C, drop that C to B, and that would be the third and the fifth of G, and that would be some close voice leading. Kurt will never do that. He'll go C to G, and no matter what the movement is, even if it's wildly out of key, he won't break that structure. He'll let his melody of his, the, the vocals and his melody make those chords work underneath. And that's what we're gonna talk about next. Number four, melody. This is the most important one. The other things that we've talked about so far would not result in so many hits if it wasn't for Kurt's genius melody writing. Can't stress this enough, the importance of melody. We're talking about big giant sing-alongs, okay, with chords that seemingly don't go together, moving power chords in minor thirds with no voice leading, okay, and you have to come up with simple, singable, forget about memorable, things you can't forget to make them all connect. Top of the mountain, my friends, the top of the mountain. So I'm gonna play some examples and show you, but there's three things I want you to look out for. Number one, almost always there's an arc. There's a two-part cycle, whether it's the verse or the chorus, there's almost always, a, it's up and it's down and it's a quick takeaway, okay? So like, like think about Smells Like Teen Spirit. Let's pull this up. Right, it's like a ba -da -da -da. 
Right? It's this arc that goes up and down, and it just keeps getting repeated. Now, that is in every single song. Let's go to Come As You Are. Come as you are, as you were, as I want you to be, as a friend, as a friend, as I know in me. Like, it, let's go to, let's go to In Bloom, okay? Yeah, now you're gonna go up. It it's so simple. It's such a basic concept where it's like every verse, every every stanza, if you will, the verse or chorus is this simple two-part cycle. And here's the other part, here's the other piece of it. There's almost always a call and response with an up and a down. So it's not always this linear curve, if you will, okay? It's, 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 let, keep going and in bloom. Listen to this part. So that right there, call and response, okay, back and forth. High to low, but a high to low, but a right, and then that's the first part of the chorus. Then the second part of the chorus is just the same formula. You have the answer to that first part of the chorus, but now it's the opposite low to high. Everything is two parts, for the most part. It all has an arc with an up, high and a low, and a call and response. Simple stanzas, simple phrases, meant for everyone to sing. Absolutely amazing. Now, let's talk about how the actual melody connects the chords. Let's go back to Smells Like Teen Spirit. Such, such a great melody. Okay, so our chords, F sharp power over to our four, B flat power chord. Up a minor third, okay, um, A flat power chord over to its fourth, which is D flat power chord. Okay, so one, four, flat three, flat six. Maybe, right? So how do we tie this together? Kurt comes in. I'll say fifth flat seven root minor third firmly putting us in F minor okay such a great jump that is by the way that is a beautiful jump and remember this also works because A flat is the relative major of F minor, meaning they contain all the same notes. So even though you start on F, shooting for that major third, it just, it gives that brightness that a pop song has to have, okay? It gives it that, you know, it, even though it's a minor tonality, it doesn't feel minor in the beginning. It, it resolves minor, okay? Totally lends itself to that mantra chant thing at the end where it's just like this angst, do they see me? Like we're gonna we're gonna finish with that, but it always starts with this little little piece of hope. It's so cool. So and then you're gonna walk down. Now that is all F this is all F minor, okay? So root flat seven, flat six, five. Four, flat three, two, which again, fifth of the five chord. That's gonna be your tag. So and then 
just firmly putting us, firmly putting us in F minor. Um, but he also shows this little blues influence too, where, where he got this. Which he gets in the solos. Um, another great example, let's do, let's do lithium. I'm so happy cause today from my friends you hear the arc now check this out you're coming in on d and again i know this is tuned down major third of d okay he's not he's not playing that but he's singing it so you got d and you got this so third ninth third so makes it squarely d major can't stress this enough. He's not playing the thirds in the chords. He's singing it. His voice is creating the chords. That's the takeaway. But check this out. Then he goes, walks up, um, six, seven, root to D. Now when the chord changes to a B flat, What happens here is his voice changes the scale when it descends. So you got that B flat and that C are not in D major, okay? They are in G minor or B flat major, right? Which is the two chords it goes to. It goes to G and B flat in power chords, but he's outlining the difference with his voice, with his voice to make it connect. So major, right there it changes. And then that's my favorite part. That G half step below the major third when you go to, these are, genius melodies. Let's look at one more. All right, this one might be my favorite. It is the perfect example of simplicity and just only stuff that you hear Kurt do, okay? Check out this chord progression. Paying attention here. All right, B flat, okay, to G flat, E flat, B, A, B flat. All power chords, no voice leading. How the hell do you make that work? What is that? Listen. So he's telling us, oh no, we're in B flat minor. That's what time it is, right? Fifth, flat three, root. Fifth, flat three, root. Okay, all right, all right, it's weird. Seems to work, still not sure why I get a, still not sure where everything else comes in, but it, it works, right? He's figuring this out with his ear, by the way, okay? It's us that analyze it. He's figuring it out with his ear. Listen to this next part. Three chromatic notes ascending. Repeats it. What? In the world is that? And it's so simple, which makes it so catchy and so singable. It's preposterously good, okay? So, 
So you got this part, right? That is the fifth of your B flat, okay? Now, now it's going down to G flat or F sharp, okay? We're going up one note, right? To F sharp, so that is now the root of the chord we're going to. So fifth of the, fifth of the chord we're on, then root. So up, so we ascend fifth root, and then wait for it. Where do we go after this? E flat. Where do we get to? The major third of E flat. So you got fifth root major third of the chord you're going to. Chromatic walk up. That right there is is I can't I can't stress enough that that's Kurt Cobain's genius in a nutshell. Chords that should not go together. Big power chords. No voice leading. Can't stress no voice leading enough. <laughs> um and you make simple melodies which have simple arcs high to low low to high call and response super singable just a few notes connects them all again with the voice quality and the lyrics to make you forget about get stuck in your head you can't forget it and it means something to you the it it's, one, it's why my favorite musical quote is by Frederick Chopin. I'm, power, I'm paraphrasing. Is that after one has played all the notes and all the notes and all the notes, simplicity reigns as the crowning reward or achievement of art. That's it, my friends. You're playing to non-musicians. You're playing to the world. The biggest audience, the most impressionable, the deepest well you can hunt in, you're hitting it straight in the bullseye. Big rock band. You're, you, you have big sound, p rudimentary power chords moving around, and it's your voice. It's their voice that connects it all in a simple way that works, connects the chords, totally natural arcs and flows, call and response, and endless repetition. It's a formula. Last but not least is the arrangement. Again, I'm not going to talk about the production on here. Rick, you can do that one. Um... You already have on a bunch. Uh, this is simple. Most everything's in 4-4. Four, four. Most everything is like 120 beats a minute, okay? Just like right on it. You know, I got lithium at 117. Comes your 122. Smells like Teen Spirit at 120. In Bloom and Heart Shape Box are a little slower, but with the subdivisions, it's still like, it's still like that similar straight-ahead feel, Right? Basically, four or eight of everything. You don't get odd time signatures. You don't get lots of threes and fives. I mean, this is straight ahead arrangement. And it always starts with the intro riff being the verse and then the drums coming in. I mean, let's do In Bloom. I mean, smells like teen spirit. It's flams, man. Come as you are. Heart shaped box. Lithium. So there's always the intro riff, which is almost always the verse. Second, there's always 
three fundamental parts, okay? We're not getting a lot of crazy bridges, crazy tangents, crazy key changes. Like you got the verse, you got a, like this middle part, which is either like a pre or post chorus, okay? Uh, and you have the chorus. That's pretty much it. Now the verse is almost always soft. Listen to Lith Lithium. I'm so happy cause today found my friend. Smells like teen spirit. Right? Come as you are. Come as you are, as you were, as I want you to be. Heart shaped box. Alright, so you got the intro riff, which is the verse. The verse is generally your quiet clean sound okay now then there's this pre or post chorus there's always one other section which is committed to getting people to sing along okay sometimes it's right before the chorus sometimes it's right after the chorus but there's always this 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 other part which has a very very simple sing-along uh, element to it so, like, in Smells Like Team Spirit, he goes, hello, 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 hello. And it, over and over again, right? That's that middle part. In Come As You Are, it's that memory. Uh, over and over, okay? Um, in Heart Shaped Box, uh, that might be one exception, but it's still got that, hey, wait, and everyone in Lithium, where it goes, because I found God, yeah. It, you would think that's the chorus, but the chorus is the, I like it, I'm not gonna crack. Right? That's the chorus. So there's always that quieter verse, and there's usually two, sometimes three of them. That's it. There's the commitment to getting people singing with a singular line, right? A singular line to get people singing. And then there's the loud, distorted chorus. And now here's one of my favorite things. This is in almost all of Nirvana songs. Um, and that's Dave Grohl coming in with a huge fill at the end of the verse to bring you into the chorus. So rock and roll, such a key component to keep everything driving. Let me give you some examples. Oh God. It's on the fourth yeah where the chorus starts. That's your downbeat, okay? Listen. Let's go to Smells Like Teen Spirit. Right? Huge fill going into the chorus. Come as you are. Heart-shaped box. Cancer when you turn back. Hey, when right? In bloom. Gotta have it. You got Dave Grohl. Let him live the rock and roll dream. Huge fills into the chorus, driving the song along, key component. Okay, two other pieces of arrangement which stick out. These songs have guitar solos. And what are the guitar solos? Wait for it. I want you to think about this one. What should they be in the biggest pop songs of all time? The melody. The melody. Why do I tell everybody all the time, learn the melody to every song that you learn, okay? It's the answer to all your questions. What should I play over that, right? The melody. All the, I, I mean, Kurt played solos in almost all of his songs. 
and he was so dedicated to the melody. Sure, there are some examples that step out, but man, come as you are. Smells like Teen Spirit. Heart shaped box. So cool. It's just, it's just, it's so, it, Heart Shaped Box has such a cool melody too because you got this, uh, you got this, um, right? But it's, it's this C sharp seven, if you will. Again, he's tuned down, but this is enharmonically correct. But during that part, it's got that, it's actually the chorus he's, he's doing the melody over. Then when it goes to this E, that becomes the major third of E, okay? And then when it goes to when it goes to C sharp, it's this third, 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 third flat seven. I just love it. I just love it. So, so you get Kurt, who again not known for flashy solos, but almost always playing solos and almost always playing the melody. Huge. Can't stress that enough. Last part about arrangement was one of the first things we mentioned. Every single one of them virtually ends with the seemingly never ending, repeating, screaming, sung as a stadium mantra, chant, confession, admonition, vulnerability, right? Just an explosion of emotion, but over and over and over again, just drilling it in your brain, we see you. You're one of us. You're not alone. We're feeling the same things. This is, this is your band. We are your people. That is such a powerful thing that Kurt understood so viscerally. Like, listen to the end of Smells Like Teen Spirit. A denial over and over again just 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 so good come as you are right memory over and over and over again in bloom right just, yeah over and over again lithium just over and over again at the end. Your advice over and over and over again. And my friends, that right there is the Nirvana hit song formula. Obviously, these are broad strokes. You can go in the weeds and the minutia if you so desire. But what I want you to really take away from this is that this is on purpose. And if you're trying to write music that connects with a broad scope of people, I would implore you, I would invite you to learn why the bands you loved so much made the choices that they chose. And even if they didn't know music theory, and they're following their ear, there's still a tremendous intuition involved, okay? And spending time learning that intuition, that why, and putting yourself in their shoes, and then trying to create through that lens will really pay off in spades, my friends. I mean, this stuff is, these are professionals, okay? And let's look at this formula again, okay? The lyrics and the subject matter. 
The most impressionable time in your life is when you're becoming an adolescent, a teenager, becoming an adult. All of us, no matter what we end up listening to for the rest of our lives, everything goes back to that time period. That's when we fell in love with music. That's when we chose to do this for a living, for those of us that do it. That's, that is the biggest, spongiest part of crafting your musical whatever, everything in life, okay? Plays directly to that and directly to the emotion. This is how you feel. I see you. You're not alone. This is your band. These are your people, right? In bloom, okay? Heart-shaped box. Smells like teen spirit. Like, come as you are. Like, these are, these are a big, these were a big deal to people, okay? To me in, in particular, a huge deal. Um, massive sing-alongs. These are pop songs. The biggest sing-alongs of all time, and they almost always end with that sing-along to leave you wanting more. Huge. Rhythm section. Again, let Dave Grohl live the rock and roll dream. Drives the bus. He's going to fill into every chorus. It's amazing. Chris being huge in that power trio, matching Kurt's riffs, but also staying right on Dave's hi-hat and ride the whole time. Um, Kurt, big, simple riffs, a clean sound, a uh, distorted sound, and power chords. Harmony. No thirds, power chords committed to moving in minor thirds, even in major tonalities. Okay? Um, chromatic connections with no voice leading virtually. No voice leading. The melody, okay? Singular voice, no backup singers. Uh, Two-part cycles going up and down with a call and response. Everything is simple. Everything's concise. Everything has an arc, okay? Everything answers something else. It's short, very few notes. Perfect, okay? And the melody is completing the chords and the harmonic tonality. The voice is what connects the chords. The voice is what does it, okay? And then the arrangement. The intro riff is the verse. You got three basic parts. The verse, which is usually quiet. You have a thing that gets people singing where it's just over and over again, over and over again. The thing smells like teen spirit. Uh, I call it like a pre or post chorus. And then you have the actual chorus, which is loud. Drum fills into the chorus. Guitar solos, which are the melody. And then you end again with the repeating chant, the mantra, the admonition, the confession, the whatever it is to leave you with, this is the right spot for you. We are your people. We are your band. And that's how you become the biggest band in the world and write the ultimate pop song. Absolutely love this video. If you dig the vibe here, if you learn something, please hit subscribe. I'm going to tell you something you probably don't know is that it doesn't matter what channel you're watching. It could be Mr. Beast. Over 75% of all viewers on YouTube are not subscribed to the video that they're watching. If you look for it, find the button and you hit it, you will get more of the stuff you want for free. I'll know it to make it and YouTube will know to serve it to you. So do that. And lastly, if you are a member at GuitarGate taking my lessons and courses, you can watch this video again ad-free and get all my notes in PDF form. Just click on the first link in the description, join GuitarGate, and you get all my lessons and courses, but then search for videos, search for Hit Song Formula, and it will be there. And lastly, my friends, follow your heart, follow your ears, keep this thing in your hands, and don't be afraid to learn why you like the things that you like. Put words to it so you can use it and make the stuff that only you can make. I love you all. Cheers.